That was Melanie Brownell and Jessica Morgan. We all call her Jess, because we'll have another Jessica. We're going to Spain! About a year ago, we found out that we were going to go on tour. Now, this is almost unheard of here. We were going to visit Spain. We have Dr. De Galvez who is from Spain and he organized this and he got Dr. Henderson on board and they said, let's do it. And so we all got excited about it and I thought, what do I remember about Spain? Nothing. <laughs> I have this El Cid replica sword you can see it, it's beautiful. But I really have no idea who El Cid is. In fact, I got this at Medieval Times in Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> but it did remind me that I could remember one thing about Spain, and that's the story of Don Quixote. I think most people remember Don Qu about Don Quixote, right? He loved all the fun stories, and he read all the romantic stories about the knights, and he read them so much that he stayed up all night. And the, the legend in the story I had it, in fact, the thinking of the day was, if you stayed up too much, your brain would go dry. And he did that, and his brain went dry, and when his brain went dry, he went a little crazy, and he began to think he was a knight, and he began to try to revive Chivalry. So let's do a little bit of skipping to the end of Manuel de Falla's life and do a little piece from one of his operas telling some of the story of Don Quixote. Dugan, come up and help me with this. You see, he wrote a piece of the Don Quixote story when he was into neoclassicism. And it talks about when Don Quixote goes to a marionette show. Master Pedro. He has these beautiful marionettes. They tell the story about the Moors. There's a princess and a prince, and the Moors come, and they do all these bad things. And Don Quixote's in the audience, and he starts to get confused. And at one point, <clears throat> he comes out, and he slashes through the marionettes. And that's where we come in. Poor Pedro has lost his whole life <laughs>
Don Quixote, <laughs> tilting windmills. I uh, used to watch Mikhail Baryshnikov and things and, and, and ballets with my dance teacher. And I remember watching that ballet as a kid and I just loved it. So where do I start when I'm trying to find something out? I'm a vocalist, so it's always with vocal music, an art song book. But it was Christmas time, it was a weekend, and it was late at night. I couldn't sleep. I wanted a project. I even found out I could get some money if I did one. So where was I going to turn? Amazon. And that little thing at the bottom, if you can't read it, this is not an advertisement for Amazon. This literally was the, how I figured out. I was in my underwear, and I was not going anywhere. <laughs> so I found this wonderful art song book by, by a publisher that I had used before, and I looked through it, and I noticed that most of the songs in this book were by Granados and Faya. According to the interwebs, Faya lived part of his life in southern Spain, and that's where we were going. He even spent some of his time in Granada, and that might be on the tour, we still didn't know for sure, but I figured, hey, I could find a way to rent a car and go up there even if we don't go. This might be what I'm looking for. So I looked for a song on YouTube and I found Asturiana by Teresa Berganza, an old black and white video, and it was beautiful. You heard our two lovely, lovely young ladies sing it as a duet. It's normally done as a solo. Uh, in fact, I have to tell you this arrangement and the one you'll hear later, I forgot to put in the program. They were arranged by our own Dr. Henderson and it was, it's missing from the program. So I apologize. I will apologize to him tomorrow and he will probably still never care. <laughs> and if you know him, you know that is true. <laughs> but I found that song and I said, I think this is what I want to do. But I wasn't sure. I still knew very little about Spain. I knew very little about these composers. I didn't know what the Spanish people thought about these composers. So I thought maybe I should find someone who knows something about this. I said, I should talk to Dr. De Galvez. The problem is, is I have anxiety disorder, and I also, the first time I met Dr. De Galvez, I called him by the wrong name. I had just learned their names. I'd been here two weeks. I called him Dr. Oozer. <laughs> <laughs> Once he spoke, I knew they weren't the same. <laughs> But I really need to know. So I swallowed all that anxiety and I pushed it as far down as I could. I saw him walking down the hall and I just repeated to myself, his name is Dr. De Galvez, his name is Dr. De Galvez. And I walked up to him and I said, do you know anything about Defia? And he said, and then I told him in a more calm voice what I was planning on doing. And he said, well, wonderful because I think he's maybe, if not the most important Spanish composer, one of the most important Spanish composers. In his opinion, the most. So I thought, this, I'm on the right track. And even better, days later, Dr. Henderson pulls out those arrangements. You heard the first one. Now you're gonna hear the second one sung by Rachel Hoffertza, who I spelled her name wrong, one F, one F, and Jessica Erickson.
a roof of glass should not throw stones to their neighbor's roof. That's how the translation begins. And I chose that as my segue. Chose these images of architecture to go with that piece. I, did you also notice when they sang, sometimes it sounded almost like there were more than just two voices singing? Could you hear the overtones? Dr. Henderson sometimes is amazing the way he finds notes that were built into the chords already and can find the way voices make them even bigger and make those angel tones. And, of course, we had some churches in there. Okay. I knew this was going to be my project, and I had to learn about Defia. I needed to figure this man out. I chose this as a project for vocal literature. And I'm going to refer closer to the end of the program. Manuel Maria de los Dolores Falla y Mateo was born in Cadiz, Spain in 1876. He began taking lessons from his mother. How old was I when I took lessons from you, Mom? Eight years old, wow. Um, they, at 13, he began music theory studies. They moved to the capital and he began to study piano with a professional teacher. He won a big prize and he be, started becoming famous enough that he began to put the name to go by the name Defia at that point. Then in 1907, he was contracted to go to Paris. For just seven weeks, he was supposed to play music, but they loved him so much and he met so many mentors that he ended up staying and studying there. He especially made a connection with Ravel and some of those composers that hung around with Ravel, and he loved being there. But when World War II broke out, or World War I broke out, sorry, we keep talking about both of those in music history, so I'm getting them backwards, but when World War I broke out, he was warned, you need to go back home, and so he did. But he did not want to leave because he was already feeling like Paris was his home. And I'm feeling the same way here. I have all these mentors that I've come here and I'm coming to the end of my studies and I know in the spring I'm gonna have to leave and yet I don't really want to. And I know, yes, nobody ever leaves Weber State, everybody says that and somehow you always come back and do <laughs> things. 
But still, that same connection isn't quite there. His mentors, he won't have that daily influence. And I felt that same. There was something about Defia that I needed to find more out about. But it really happened as I began to pick music to study. I picked Asturiana to study for my voice lessons. And I also picked Nana. It was a lullaby. And I just love lullabies. Well, I'm going to skip ahead to now. I didn't do very well with Nana for reasons we will discuss later. But I have started learning Cancion. Ah. And I think this one's a fun song. I saw these men and took pictures of them while I was waiting in line uh, in Sevilla to get into one of the Moorish palaces. And uh, they were playing guitar and they were singing. And I, I didn't know what they were singing about. But I imagine they were singing a song about love and, and passion, uh, much like this one. And I didn't quite understand the words in the translation in the art song book. Because they are traitors, your eyes, I am going to bury them. Now, this is fairly literal, but that seemed rather macabre to me. So you'll notice I found a better translation for those of us who don't understand Spanish very well. Because your eyes are traitors, I will hide from them. You don't know how painful it is to look at them. Mother, I feel worthless, mother. They say they don't love me, and yet once they did love me. Speaking again about the eyes. Love has been lost in the air. Mother, all is lost. It is lost, mother. And if I remember to click, you'll also see a husband and bride who was also standing in that same plaza while we were waiting, who I loved. And then you'll see some eyes that I thought were creepy. <laughs> Cantillon. <laughs> I started clicking. <sighs> I should have just waited to click till the end, just like I did the other time. <laughs> these, <laughs> I don't know. I loved these sculptures all over the place. And I could never tell which ones for sure were Moorish, or which ones were Spanish, or which ones were some sort of conglomeration of both. But these ones sure seemed Gothic to me. And they were scary. So when I first read that translation, and I didn't see the, your eyes, I'm going to bury them. <laughs> That's what I thought of. <laughs> and then I, I looked a little deeper. So we got on the plane. And I told you before, I have an anxiety disorder. And the plane scared me to death. I planned ahead where I was going to sit and who I was going to sit by so carefully 
so that I knew that not only was I going to be okay sitting by them, but I was going to be okay getting up out of my seat, going to the bathroom, and not feeling like I was going to be disturbing that person. We had a young lady, uh, some of you may know Carolyn, so nice, never makes anyone anxious. However, when I got there that day, for whatever reasons, the gods of the airlines changed those, and I was sitting next to Dr. De Galvez, <laughs> who I was still frightened of. And I was sitting next to him, and for the first third of the flight, I sat there. I tried not to move. I didn't use the restroom, even though for a lot of that time I did have to. <laughs> and, and I was frightened to move. I did pull out my Nintendo 3DS, and I played a little bit. And he would, every once in a while, try to make conversation, and I would answer yes or no, or mumble something. And I was scared. I was on the aisle. It made me a little less frightening, but then then I had to worry about not being in the way of the lady going up and down the aisle and up and down the aisle. But then his son, he also had his son, Pablo, and his daughter there and his wife on the plane. And he kept helping his son and his daughter. And at one point, he traded places with Pablo so that he could help with his daughter more. And suddenly, Pablo sees me with my Nintendo playing Pokemon. <laughs> and that was it. Pablo said, you play Pokemon? <laughs> you play Pokemon? And he spoke to me for the rest of the flight about Pokemon. And Dr. Galvez is looking over at me like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> This is the same look I had given to people about my own children a million times. <laughs> and this did two things for me. The first is, I've always believed when a child hands you a pretend phone and it doesn't matter how serious you are and intellectual you are or tough you are, you pick up that pretend phone and you say hello. <laughs> if a child gives you their attention, for as long as they're willing to give you that, you keep it. And Pablo talking to me, even though he talked my ear off and I could not keep up with him, it calmed me down. And the second thing is, is I looked at Dr. DeGalvez and saw that same look I had given so many times and realized as genius as that man was, and as much as I looked up to him, he was a dad, just like me, and he worried about exactly the same things as I did most of the time. And suddenly, I could talk to him, and I still can talk to him. Yeah, sometimes I still get nervous, and sometimes I still put him up on a pedestal, but he's a man. So that flight changed me. It's exciting. You're going to do things that you don't think you can do. You're going to have to go and find los servicios in the bar that you find in the alleyway because you just have to go. <laughs> and you heard that the bars are the nicest places and are most willing to let you go. And honestly, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and then you sit there and drink Diet Coke. And guess what? The one I found was playing classic rock. <laughs> Of all places to hear sticks playing over <laughs> in Spain. And I had a conversation with the, the, the lady bartender. I said, I love this. It makes me feel like I'm a kid back at home. She says, I love this too. And I'm like, it just never occurred to me that somebody in some other country might like sticks. <laughs> and you learn things about yourself that you never knew you were going to learn. So we made it to Sevilla. Now, you've already seen the joke, but let me tell it to you again. I'd been here before. I got to the Plaza de España, and 
And it was so familiar, so familiar. I could not figure out why. And I walked around that plaza and I wasted an entire SD card taking pictures. I had to change cards. And then I took some for, on my phone as well. I just kept taking pictures of this place because I, I felt like I'd been there before. And it's beautiful. I mean, you look at this fountain, you could find something like this in New York. Maybe that's what it was. But I couldn't figure out where it was. I'd seen this place before. <laughs> Until I got home and realized that they turned the half circle into a full circle and made it into Naboo. <laughs> And look, there's still people in the background. It looks like they're all tourists. <laughs> you could walk into Star Wars. You could make this picture if you walked there and got the right angle. We went to Marbella, to Ronda, to Antequera. Ronda, by the way, if you want to see a storybook place with, with a bridge that overlooks a chasm, go to Ronda. Walk into a storybook and go to Ronda. And you will think you've been there before as well because you've been there in your brain. Moorish influences everywhere. Classical influences. All the things you've ever thought of about Europe in these places. I saw things that reminded me of when I went to Bulgaria and Turkey the three years prior. And Dr. Galvis kept telling us these stories, these folk stories. And he told us about the olive groves that we kept passing as we were traveling to and from these places. And that Spain made even better olive oil than Italy. Their extra virgin olive oil was better and he got a little bit mixed up on how he said that. And we laughed. <laughs> now let's hear Polo. We're going to take you to Rondo. As Sarah sings this. I also forgot to put the slide of the bull ring. Imagine that in your head, because that should have gone in between there. But we ended our trip in Ronda, here, on a street just like this. We saw the bull ring. We didn't see a bullfight. But we have this intense moment. We have this wonderful song. And it goes with this, because right as we got back onto the bus, we saw these two drunk men fighting in the street, right here in the dark, just like we might see here in America, too, or anywhere we went. People are 
are the same everywhere. In fact, in the church that we saw at the first of the piece, I wanted a, a brochure. So I went and tried to make it n known to the curator or the, the lady at the front. I said, do you have a, a pamphlet or a brochure? And she said, uh, she, after a while, she finally figured out what I wanted. She said, no, but I have a booklet about this, the church. And then she pulled out this booklet, and it was a small paperback, and it was still folded and stapled. It was like a, but it was obviously one that you purchased. And she said, this is mine, I purchased it. And she gave it to me, and I'm like, that's not what I meant. No, but she would insisted. And she was generous, and she gave it to me and wouldn't take it back. So, of course, I just said thank you and, and appreciated it. And I will never forget that. Generosity is everywhere. The stories Dr. Galvez told us were familiar. Folk tales about lovers who weren't supposed to be together. Well, I'd heard stories like this in the Midwest. We hear some of them in our own folk tales from here. Shakespeare tells these stories too. The people like that lady, so familiar. They need to work, they need to eat, to be loved, to be clothed, and they need their laundry done like I did. And I found it finally after days walking almost. Though on the way back I did get chocolate churros. <laughs> and the laundry mat was almost the same and even though I could not figure out that their coin machine was completely separated from the laundry machines and on the other side of the room and someone had to show me how, how someone still did and they were very patient with me. They didn't treat me like I was a stupid American though they probably thought it and that's okay. They were very nice. And once I got it, it was great, and I did my laundry. And I even left it there because I felt so comfortable like I did, I loved my laundry when I did my laundry here. I went over, I was hungry, I went to the grocery store, got some food, came back, and there my laundry was. Because it felt like home. The people were the same there. I'm seeing the same thing there. So that's an awkward segue into our next piece. This is a Moorish plinth. Laundry is what you do to cloth. Our next piece, El Pano Murano, is about the Moorish cloth. <laughs> On the fine cloth in the store, a stain has fallen. It sells at a lesser price because, alas, it has lost its value, alas. Paul Gibson, one of our freshmen, will sing the Moorish cloth. Notice the Moorish influences in the architecture and the tile up here as he does. <laughs>
Spanish people were resilient. They were surrounded on all sides by water. They learned, the, the very first picture I showed was a fortification right above Malaga. And you can't remember it, and I'm not going to go back. Sorry. But it's a fort that overlooks the seaport. They're all over the outer skirts of Spain. They were conquered by the Moors, and then they overthrew them. But yet, they didn't just erase all traces of the Moorish culture. They found ways to look at that time and hold on to it and remember it as a time that they built strength and they incorporated these things in their culture, and they still hold it as something proud now. The people of Bulgaria had a similar way of looking at the, uh, the rule of the Ottomans. They didn't look quite so kindly about the way the Soviets did, but maybe that's because the Soviets only built in concrete. Um, anyway, they recognized the good things that the other culture had given them. And it continued to influence their culture, including flamenco music. And when Manuel de Falla settled in Granada, one of the big things he did was start a competition between another composer. They continued to try to revive the art of flamenco. In fact, the f reason why flamenco continues to be done in Spain and then throughout the world is because of the, the work of these two composers, mainly Manuel de Falla. It's really beautiful sound. We think of the dancing, but you can hear the modal sound of the Moorish influence in the way it's sung. The changes in mode, even though the, the guitar is played with all the typical chords that we normally hear, the sound of the singer is very bright and open and brassy. And it seems very harsh to uh, an American's ears, or anybody with any classical training. <laughs> the passion, though, in those voices, and the passion in the dance is amazing. The stories of the lovers, you can hear the lovers who aren't supposed to be together, like the story that Dr. Galvez told us. Two young children. Uh, two young children who were not supposed to be together. Their parents didn't like each other. So they decided to gather together and leap off of this cliff hand in hand. And then you can still see the faces of the lovers in the mountain. We have similar stories. Who's heard of the the Native Americans at Mount Tipinogos and the faces that you can see there. There's a lover's leap story in the Midwest that I heard. Shakespeare and Romeo and Juliet. Our cultures have so many similar stories and we're so close to each other and we don't realize it. And by the way, when Dr. De Galvez told it, somehow the extra virgin olive oil and the two young lovers became intertwined in it. <laughs> it in a very unfortunate way. <laughs> and here's the mountain. Let's hear Jota. Not quite the same story, but two lovers who aren't supposed to be together anyway. Thank you. 
Ireri Tetelpa, everyone. You can see the face. I mean, it's really obvious. This is a view from Rhonda. Um, that whole city is built up on a hill. And while it was very tiring to walk with all our clothes and things, I, I would, do not regret a single moment of it because of the storybook-like moments of it. We finally made it to Granada, and I felt like I'd finally find Defaya here. But I like to wander, and I got a little lost, so I didn't have time to go to Defaya's house. So I grabbed a cab, and I hurried up to Alhambra Palace so that I could meet up with everybody else. Alhambra Palace he spent a lot of time at. This is important. I mean, he talked with other poets there. He spent time with his friend, the poet Lorca. He, he taught him some of, he start, began to teach Lorca about music because Lorca wanted to become more than just a poet. He wanted to become a musician as well. And that's where Lorca uh, started learning music from Defaya. I got up to Alhambra Palace, and the grounds around the palace itself were so beautiful, I got lost again. I couldn't find the entrance <laughs> to the palace. And my ticket time passed up. And Dr. Galvez and our uh, uh, guide from Malaga uh, Jorge was his name, wasn't it? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I didn't put it in there because then I was afraid I'd spell it wrong. <laughs> and he went back and he pleaded for them to reset my ticket. I'm pretty sure what he said was, this is a stupid American and he doesn't know how to find things. <laughs> and I don't care because they did it. It took about 10 minutes of pleading, and there was some very irate-looking uh, speech between the two of them. But I made it in, and I began to look for these plaques. I found the one for Washington Irving. It wasn't just Spanish composers and Spanish writers who went there, and Spanish artists. Uh, I'm, there was one for Picasso in there somewhere as well. All of these wonderful artists and poets, you could find pieces of them there. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to find him there. But the more I looked, oh, by the way, I have to stop and tell you this. This isn't painted. This is all three-dimensional. Those are all carved up into the ceiling of this place. So all those little, tiny little bits, it may look very messy if it was painted. And it's hard to really show in a picture exactly what you're looking at. But imagine how deep that goes and how many little teeny alcoves of carving and sculpture that is. It's beautiful and astounding. Once again, this was a Moorish palace long before the, Spains took their land, the Spaniards took their land back. And then this. Our own culture has been influenced by things just like this. I've seen things like this here in Utah. So similar. Not used in the same way, of course. But I had to take a picture, and I loved it. Yeah, they're working on it. You could see they've been doing some renovation to the area. But I loved this whole square. and the gardens and the water features. So important to the Moorish culture. Water is life. Now it is to everyone, but the Moors, the, the Islamic culture and the Islamic faith reveres water probably more than anybody else. And they put it in everything, in all their architecture, and the gardens inside palaces and inside everything. This was so dramatic. I had pictures down in the garden, which is astounding. 
But this is my favorite picture of this area. I took a lot of pictures in this area, too. <laughs> and the dungeon. Yeah. Now, I took a picture of this partly because I just love dungeons. <laughs> and I'm weird. But also, as Defiah got older, first they celebrated his life. 50 years, they celebrated his birthday and gave him honors like crazy in Granada. Gave him, made up new honors just to give him. Not too long after that, though, the Spanish Civil War began to stir up. And he was kind of on the wrong side of the revolution. They loved him still so much, even though politically he began to not be so well liked, that they said, let's protect him. They moved him to an island just off of Portugal to keep him safe. He even found out that his friend, the poet Lorca, was in trouble and tried to warn him and tried to tell everybody to quit being mean to Lorca and to some of the other people who were considered rabble-rousers. But Lorca was assassinated anyway, and he lost his dear friend. And I began to feel like I had failed in my job. Yeah, not as badly as if I'd lost a friend. I made it through, and I'd seen so many wonderful things, but I never found my piece of Manuel de Falla, the thing that I was looking for all the way through Spain. So I wandered into the gift shop thinking maybe I can find a gift for my kids. And I slowly walked through and I walked down to the end of one of the aisles and I saw this. It was a book. Now it was in Spanish and I couldn't read it. Manuel de Falla y la Alhambra. And on the front cover, there he was standing. That square I took multiple pictures of, tons of them, much like the other place that I'd taken pictures of in Seville. And you know those moments in movies when the character, and it seems so cheesy, starts looking at the photo and they reach out as if they can touch the person in it. And you think, oh, this is so dumb. Nobody does that. I started really doing that. And here I was back and forth, images in my brain. And all I was thinking, it was just me looking straight back and forth between me and the man in the picture. This man with the mustache and this old hat standing in front of this fountain that was obviously different now than it was then. And I was just there. And then my hand touched the book. I felt the smooth cover of the dust jacket and the magic of it all was gone. I didn't realize until I got home. Now we went to Italy, a place I dreamed since I was a child of going to. Since I first learned about the composers being from Italy, since I first learned that legato was an Italian word from my mother when she taught me piano when I was eight. I'm sure I wasn't eight when she taught me that word, but I mean, starting at eight, I wanted to visit Italy. I wanted this all my life, but that moment right there was the one that stuck with me more than anything else. As magical as Venice was at night, as much fun as it was to 
reach out and grab Jessica Erickson and pull her tight when I was worried that that guy was going to try to give, force her to take the rose. <laughs> Knowing that she's an adult and she can take care of herself, I still wanted to be protective. <laughs> All those great moments I had, the opera in Venice, Florence, the Uffizi, all these things I'd waited all for my entire life, that was the moment that stuck with me and I couldn't get out of my head and I came back and I thought about why it stuck with me. And then I began to realize it. It was that he didn't want to leave Paris and I didn't want to leave here. It was that he learned from his mother first, just like I had. It was all the things that I started seeing in him that I started seeing in me. But mostly, it was that lullaby that I tried so hard to learn but couldn't quite get. You see, I was the stay-at-home dad for so many years. First of all, let me tell you, it's like in The Lion King. Who remembers? Rafiki says, you want to see Mufasa? He's over there. And he points through the reeds and Simba pokes his head up out. And he looks out into the water and just like we saw here, as the water begins to settle, Simba realizes that he was really looking at himself the whole time. He was looking for himself the whole time. Like I said, I was a stay-at-home father for all those years. I wanted to be, and I loved it. Mothers get a chance to nurse their kids but you don't get to know this one thing that I got to know. Most of you, if you have kids or if you learn this, know this now. If your child is fussy, run a vacuum. If your child is fussy, take them on a car ride. And for most children, a colicky child especially, it will calm them down. The vibrations. I'm a baritone. And I was a stay-at-home dad. And every night, I would put my children on my chest. And I would sing as loudly as I could, and I'd rock back and forth in the rocking chair. I was born one morning when the sun didn't shine. I picked Dumb. Anything low that I could sing. In fact, one of my favorites was to sing an art song I learned here called American Lullaby. Hush by you sweet little baby, and close those pretty blue eyes. I raised four boys. But Tina and I had five. In 2004, our fourth son was born, 24 weeks, 24 and a half weeks, very small, and it was so long before I could have that time, but I was still Mr. Mom, and Tina still worked, and so once I got the chance to hold him, I put him on my chest. But at first, I couldn't sing to him. We were in the NICU, and it was not private. When I finally got to a place where we could have that space where I could sing to him, he'd gone down to the U for eye surgery. His retinas were detaching. But I didn't care that you could still hear me through the walls. I put him on my chest and I'd rock back and forth and it'd still calm him. 
my little Matthew, and I'd rock back and forth, and I'd sing as loudly as I could. And they were trying to get him to grow as much as they could, and they'd put as many calories in his feeding tube as they could because he needed heart surgery. They wanted to get him grown as much as they could before they did it. And the time came when it was, they couldn't wait any longer. And he had heart surgery. And once again, I couldn't touch him again. So I recorded those lullabies and put them on a CD to leave with him when I couldn't be there. And they'd play them over and over. And ever, ever since then, I've been collecting lullabies for myself. You see, that's when I should have known that I was looking for myself the whole time. It's when I wanted that lullaby for myself. And that's why I won't sing it for you tonight. We go out into the world on these kind of journeys and we come to school to find the world. And to, but we can only ever see the world through our own eyes. That's the only lens we have. We can only ever see ourselves in it. It's the best we can do. I couldn't have seen that until I went. Yeah, I had to go on the journey in order to get that. And I couldn't have gotten that experience until I went there. If you have a chance to do something like this, do it, especially if you're young. Expand your brain. Do something, even if it scares you. Because you'll learn things about yourself that you didn't think you knew. And you'll find yourself in other places, in other people's stories. That's why you go on a study abroad. That's why you study music. That's how I found Defy, and that's how I found, found Spain. It was doing all that and going and coming home again. I'm going to ask my friend, Sarah Singer, to finish with the lullaby. Nana. And I want to thank you all for coming today. And then the program will be over. Thank you. <laughs>